It's always good to stand and be here in the presence of the Lord. On tonight, I take nothing for granted. I, again, thank my pastor and my first lady for an opportunity. It's awesome to have my spiritual parents here just to support me and push me. I thank God for my son being here tonight. I stood on that word last week that my children would come. And I give glory to God for that opportunity. Now I ask that you all stand. On last week, we had an opportunity to visit a word. And that word came from John 10, 26 and verse 27. This is where Jesus stated, but you don't believe me because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. You all may be seated. For those of you at home and those of you in the audience, the part one of this um, message is on our Going Hard for Christ webpage. So please go and visit so that you can subscribe and get all of the messages. But tonight, this is going to be a continuation, so to speak. Uh, one of the things that the Lord put on my heart after Pastor called and asked me uh, if there was a part two to this message. On last Wednesday, the message was preached. On last Thursday, when I woke up, he actually gave me a new revelation that I wanted to share with you guys on tonight. We spoke about Abraham and Isaac, his son Isaac. We spoke about the faith of Abraham. We also spoke about Abraham being tested. We spoke about God's covenant and we spoke about um, Abraham's faith. So tonight, I would like to go just do a brief recap of what that looks like or what that looked like in the word that we covered on last week, briefly. But tonight is more so about you, each individual one of us, because we can talk about Abraham, but the heartbeat of the word of God is to make it personal, keep it personal. So there are some key points that I'd like to go over with you tonight. Um, if you could turn to 2 Corinthians 13 and 5. I'm going to be reading out of the English Standard Version. 2 Corinthians 13 and 5. We know that last week we talked about God testing Abraham. This particular passage of scripture, it states, examine yourselves to see whether you are in faith. Test yourselves. See, a lot of offenses that we often come up with and we have, if we examine ourselves, nobody else has to. continuation of that same scripture says, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? And that's a question. But in the statement of that question, do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? You should be asking yourself, is Jesus Christ really in me? Because something that we've got to be able to identify with is our characteristics what's of Jesus and what's not. Because those are the things, those are the very things you have to keep in mind. We have a real adversary, we have a real enemy. And it's nothing personal against you, it's personal against God. He wants your soul. And what he's gonna do is he's gonna manipulate and he's gonna do everything pleasing to your flesh because that's what he has access to. Remember on last week, we spoke about the fact that the enemy couldn't have access as long as the blessing and as long as the assignment and the purpose is in heaven, 
he has no power, he has no authority in heaven. So he has to wait until the assignment has entered our flesh. Once the assignment has entered our flesh, it's at that time that you will be tested. My sheep, they listen to my voice. One of the things that I've noticed, because I've had to go through that whole process of being the sheep that didn't hear the, the voice of the Lord, and quite frankly didn't want to at a part, certain point in time in my life, because I didn't want to correct my life. I was having fun in my life. I was having fun giving myself permission to die. And the bottom line to that is whether it's a physical death or a spiritual death, that's what each one of us are doing every time we make a decision to not choose this day who we're going to serve. The reference to Abraham and the fact that God is a generational God, and, and you guys got to catch this because this was that Thursday revelation. I got up and I said, okay, God, we're finished with Abraham, and I've talked about Sarah, and there's nothing left. And the Holy Spirit convicted me at that moment and showed me in a blink of an eye Isaac carrying the wood. He showed me in the blink of the eye that I wasn't finished with Abraham because the point of Isaac carrying the wood was that Isaac, yes, was a sacrifice, but he wasn't the sacrifice. If we stop and think about who else carried wood, we have to stop and think about Jesus. Jesus is our savior. Abraham made a statement to his son, and he said God would provide the sacrifice. It was 42 generations later, God's a generational thinker, that he did provide the sacrifice so that there would not have to be any more blood sacrifices that we could just submit and we could just accept him right where we are, doing what we're doing, and it's going to be okay. By his stripes, we're healed. By his blood, we're saved. And it's by the admission of our sins that we get to choose who we're going to serve. It's by omission of where we are intimately, because who knows you better than yourself? We just read that the word of God says to test ourselves. One of the things that I also wanted to mention just in this passage is the vision of this house. The scripture that we stand on in this house is Matthew 28, 19. And if we understand that, we all understand that initially when we come into the church or we become a community of believers that just as Jesus had to go into the temple and be instructed, we can't sidestep that. The instruction comes from the word of God. It also comes from the power of connections and relationships. There's a reason why the first commandment said to love God and then love your neighbor as yourself. Because if I love you, there's really no need for the law in my life because I'm not gonna kill you. I'm not gonna steal from you. I'm not going to hurt you in any way. I don't have to covet what you have because we're family and we can share. The word of God and the law had to come because we as people got selfish and full of sin. We disconnected from the word of God. We no longer fellowshiped. We gave God our 10%. Well, we didn't give God anything. There was a time when we fellowshiped in the fullness of his, 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 his deity. But then there came a time when we were so busy serving idols and doing the things that we wanted to do that we didn't give him nothing. So that's why the word of God asked us for that 10% of a sacrifice. But at any point in time that we decide that we're gonna give him that full 100% of us and submit, 
will notice the changes in our lives and it comes naturally because we're natural beings. This vessel is a natural being, but we have a spirit that resides in this fleshly body. That spirit is either gonna be a contaminated spirit or it's gonna be a Holy Spirit. We get to decide that. We family, right? Okay. One of the things that I know, I've noticed just being in the position that I've grown to be in, because I haven't always been here. Point number one is distractions. When we understand that Peter got distracted, that's the reason why when he stepped out on the boat, he was able to actually see Jesus. And as long as he had his focus, y'all know the story. He was able to walk on the water. The water is symbolic to your hangups, your habits. The water is your problems. If we have our eyes on Jesus, it minimizes our problems. It minimizes our situation. There's not a need for narcotics, drugs, alcohol. There are certain things that we do not have to have if our eyes stay on Jesus because we're spiritual beings. And unless that spirit is contaminated, we don't want to do anything to not please the Father because that first commandment, we do love God. That second commandment, I don't want my neighbor to fall as a result of my decisions. So what many people do is they decide that they want to stay in and, and be okay because one of the things Pastor and I were talking about is I do remember, I, I do remember coming to church and not being a, a, a member connected to the body. I remember coming into the church and not feeling like I wanted to raise my hands or, or anything because my mind was not submitted to that whole process. In my mind, I was clearing my conscience. I wasn't coming to meet a holy God that could save me and deliver me. I was actually thinking more about the people that may see me at the club, that may see me out somewhere, and I'm in the process of doing something that's not holy. So that prevented me, I'm, I'm telling it on myself, that prevented me from being able to come into the glory of the Lord. See, this is his sanctuary. This is his house. This is his holy place. There was a time in the word of God prior to Jesus dying on the cross where there was a bell that was tied around the high priest when he went, one person, one priest went into the Holy of Holies and there was a rope tied around his waist so that if he fell out because God killed him, because he didn't make the right sacrifice that you had to, you couldn't touch an unclean thing. So they had to pull him out by this rope. The bell, the sound of the bell was an indication that he had hit the floor. When Jesus died on Calvary, what happened was the bell was torn in the temple. So that gives you direct access. There is no more veil. So when we have to come in here and our praise and worship team have to pump and prime and beg us to come up, if you do nothing else but with your natural eyes, you're able to see, I'm going to praise him. If, we're, if I got hands, I'm going to praise him because I get to raise my hands. It's that type of submission that you may not have everything that you wanted, but guess what? You got more than some people have. And if... Yeah, give God some praise on that. Amen. One, one of the things that we get distracted by is, is, again, the fact that the devil really wants your soul. He does not want you giving God any glory. He doesn't want you giving God any honor. He doesn't want you to give God any praise. And he certainly don't want you giving God your soul. So now we have to think as that enemy for a hot second. Don't stay there. But think as the many enemy for a hot second. What would I do to my enemy to keep him from being successful? I would trick him. I would sabotage him. 
Guess what? Yeah, tricks, sabotage. We fall for it every day that we make a decision that our character doesn't look like Christ because we're the ones that's coming into his house. We're the one that's receiving this download, this word. We're the ones that are held responsible once it's spoken out in the pulpit. Our character is what's going to carry us. Our character is what's going to make people want to love God. And our character can make people not want to have anything to do with the church. It works both ways. So don't be a distraction. The fact that God is a generational thinker, he thought about already Moses and the fact that he was a stutterer. He talked about Noah and the fact that he really wasn't a carpenter. He thought about David and the fact that David wasn't a king when he went to go fight Goliath. He thought about Paul. Paul was a murderer of the Christians, but he began to write and he wrote two thirds of the word. The part of this that we get to is submission. Our purpose can't thrive, it can't live, it can't begin without us learning first that we have to become submitted to our flesh. We have to become submitted to the point that we realize that it's a dead thing. When our spirit is extracted from this vessel, they put it in the ground or they burn it. But the spirit, it lives on. Now you get to decide whether or not you live in eternal hell or if you get to go and be in glory with the Lord by every decision that you make from this day forward because again, you're responsible for this information that goes forth. One of the other points that I wanted to reference was um, Romans 12 and two. The word of God says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Our mind is that battlefield. And if you've ever experienced Jesus, there would be no doubt at all that playing church is not going to get it. Playing church is just like, I was speaking with one of my spiritual daughters about this, playing church is like getting shot and putting a, a, a Band-Aid on that gunshot wound. Playing church can become contagious. It can become infectious because we never get to the truth. We never get to the source. The real relationship is never birthed because we think we're okay. Remember, my enemy wants to fool me. My enemy wants to play a trick on me and make me think that I don't have to read my word. The enemy wants to play a trick and make me think I don't have to pray. The enemy wants to play a trick and tell you that you're not qualified to be able to do anything in a ministry because of this, that, and the other. But see, God knew that Noah was a drunk. God knew that David was going to cheat. He was going to be an adulterer. God knew that Rahab was a prostitute. So what's your excuse? What's your excuse? Submitting is a matter of taking control of your mind and saying, this is what I have to do for my life to be saved. It's not the preacher preaching you're happy. It's not about you coming and being motivated because, oh, they're going hard for Christ over there. And, and it's none of that. The basics of learning how to live our lives for Christ, it starts at being submitted. Once we've decided to be submitted, one of the other things that I want to point out that Abraham did, even in the midst of him knowing 
that God had asked him to give up what he loved, his son. He worshiped God. He worshiped God. We have to develop a spirit of worship. Anyone that's gone to this church any amount of time, we've always seen our pastor, ah, you know, our pastor is free. And when I learn to be free, you see me down here as well. And the fact that the altar is not always free makes me feel like there's people that maybe is not free. And that also lets me know that if you're not free, that you're not connected with Jesus, you're not connected with the source. I'm not saying that you got to get down here and fall out and scream and you got to praise the way that you see other people praise, but God deserves something. God deserves something out of your mouth because the word of God says that praise inhabits, God will inhabit the praises of his people. So if that's what he inhabits, if Abraham went and he went to worship the Lord before he took his one and only son to be sacrificed, that ram that was in the bush, we already know that that ram wasn't a sacrifice. That ram was deliverance. That ram delivered Isaac from death. We have to understand the concept of the word of God and not just read the pages in the book, but we have to ask God for clarity so that we're able to understand, Lord, what is it that you're really saying? What the Lord is really saying to you is that Jesus, not pastor, not me, not pastor Madeline, not pastor Dean, Jesus is your deliverer. Jesus, call on Jesus, y'all. Let me hear you say Jesus, just call on Jesus. We wanna lift up the name of Jesus every opportunity that we have and not feel like we're doing Jesus a favor. He died on the cross to save you. We can't make this labor some like, oh, well, I don't feel like raising my hands up today. Tomorrow you might not have them. Tomorrow you might not be able to walk. I, I've talked to people that have had strokes and, 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 and one minute they were fine and the next, next minute their face is disfigured and not in a good way. Because see, without Jesus, we're carrying worry, we're carrying stress, we're not sleeping. We're I'm talking, I'm bringing it down to the basics because that's what God told me to do. What you're carrying is actually affecting your organs and, and it's affecting you to the point that you could be one of those people running to the emergency room because all of a sudden you got blurred vision. All of a sudden you got a limp. And it's not from wrestling with the angel of the Lord. <laughs> you got a limp for being disobedient in your spirit. And God's like, okay, you don't want to praise me? All right, then you won't be able to lift that hand. You won't be able to clap your hands. You won't be able to see my glory. Because boom, you're blind. Car accident. And guess what? What you don't tackle right now, it passes on to the next generation. So now your kids got to deal with stuff that you didn't deal with. Can't make it any more basic, y'all. These distractions that we're allowing to come into our minds and take over our souls and to be able to occupy the space that the Lord says that he will not share his glory with another. But we are putting all kinds of, making all kinds of exceptions. Oh, well, I'm too tired to read my word. And God, I'm too tired. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High Hallelujah. shall reside in the shadow of the Almighty. This is elementary. Because, see, there's a whole higher level. We're still functioning as sheep. God wants us trained to be servants. But because of the distractions, we can't get past sheep. 
We're still dealing with sheep elementary stuff. I don't know if I want to come to church today, sheep. I don't know if I want to serve in this auxiliary, sheep. I don't know if I want to pray today, sheep. How are we going to get to the point where we are serving Matthew 28, 19, going out with the mandate for Christ. How are we going to get to that point when we don't even want to talk to the Lord? And you don't have to have a prayer closet to do it. You can communicate with the Lord walking down the street in the shower while you're eating your food. You, you, it's not that difficult. We can't be like the scribes and Pharisees and everything got to be under some kind of structure. The devil is alive. Philippians 2 and 5. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used in his own advantage. See? Stop right there for a minute. Our motives are messed up. Our motives are messed up. We want to come and say that we went to church because we're using God to our own advantage. I can tell somebody I went to church, but if my lifestyle and my actions don't represent Christ and I'm not submitted to the glory of God, then there's no change. I'm talking about me. I was in and out to church for 50 years. Y'all know my story. There was no change in my life. And the reason why there wasn't a change because I never cracked open the book unless I was going through rehab. I never really prayed and asked God for anything unless I wanted something. I'm talking about me. I'm not talking about y'all, so don't take it personal. Get mad and leave. I was ready to get real offended <laughs> because for a long time, even since I've been coming here, I thought about them people that didn't do something for me when I was wounded and broken and all of that, but I didn't open my mouth to tell them nothing. I walked around in my makeup and my stilettos looking cute, but I never let anybody know I was wounded. I didn't ne never let anybody know that it was something going on with me. And then I read Revelations 12, 11, and the word of God said, and they overcame him, the enemy by the blood of the lamb, except in Christ, and the words of our testimony. See, my testimony might be helpful to somebody, but yours is too. God needs what belongs to him, people. God needs all of that. And so while we're not feeling like we're good enough, while we're not feeling like we can come and worship, people need to see how you go through. If Christ is in you at all, and if we're praising, and guess what? If your family members or if people are watching you and you keep coming, but then they see you come down here on the altar and they see you praising. But see, you know what? God is so faithful in his word that when you're coming down here and you're faithful and you're worshiping him and you're showing, he's going to give you deliverance in the bush. He's going to give you that ram in the bush. Your problem ain't going to stay where your problem's at right now. Your problem is going to come up on the altar and be burnt up. It's going to be that sacrifice. And God is going to give you, according to Jeremiah 29, 11, he's, gonna, he's got plans for you. So even though it looks a certain way right now, don't trip. It's just a test. Don't trip. It's just a test. It's a test to see if you're going to curse God like Job, Job's wife. It's a test to see what you're going to do. What are you going to do? Are you going to curse God and die? Are you going to stay where you are? Y'all give God some praise. Amen. 
See, once we go past, once we go past that um, realizing the distractions and we, we get past that point where we understand that we're coming into a holy place, holy God. This is not the place where I say, hey, girl, that's out there. Because if somebody's on this altar, they're trying to reach and get, and they might be right there trying to touch the hem of Jesus' garment, and you're talking about what you're going to go eat. Total distraction. When I asked the question last week, are you the sheep or are you the wolf, figure that one out. Because, see, our behaviors have got to change. And I know you might not know better, but what, now you do. So when you know better, do better. No more excuses to come into this sanctuary and hold personal conversations sheep or servants we should be down here serving the people that are down here crying out at this altar we can visit outside these doors y'all when the pulpit announces go and touch your neighbor talk to your neighbor go and say something to your neighbor that's the time to do that anything else is a distraction and you may miss what God has for you because you're not coming to get what he's got for you. It's basic, y'all. It's real basic. The next point is the transformation process. The mind is the heartbeat of the soul. One of the scriptures that I pulled from that was Philippians 2 and 5. I just read that. I'm sorry. Um, two, five, eight through eight. Um, in relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider with God to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. He made himself nothing. So those of us that maybe have pride issues or we feel like we got to do certain things or look a certain way, you don't. Jesus made himself nothing so that he could be a faithful servant. It says, by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. So he, he showed us what to do. All we got to do is read the word and duplicate, duplicate. It's the rhythm in the kingdom. It's not hard. And guess what? This is going to look different for each one of us because each one of us are in a different place in our lives. It says, and being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. We all must desire. <laughs> that, that's the thing. We want our purses, we want our cars, we want our fancy houses and furniture. Do you, do you desire a spiritual death as much as you want the material things of this world? Spiritually dying to the sin nature is a requirement because, see, I said this is, Mm, I normally don't even have water up here. Okay, so this bottle is empty. Let's just imagine, y'all work with me. This bottle is empty. So there's a spirit that's in this bottle when I take the top off this bottle. I'm either going to feel, because the Word of God tells us that light and darkness is not going to stay in the same place, and the Holy Spirit is not going to dwell in an unclean place. So as long as I'm contaminated on the inside and I'm, you know, acting a certain way, I'm being a certain way, I'm treating people a certain way, and it's not of God, it's not a display of the fruits of the Spirit, what's happening is that this bottle is now contaminated. Jesus is not here. The Holy Spirit is not dwelling there. So if you wonder why repeatedly you're feeling like cussing people out and you're feeling like talking crazy to people and you're feeling like coming to church and treating the church people a certain way, you can't listen to the leaders, don't want to abide by the word of God, don't want to read the word of God, don't want to pray. When you find that, check your bottle. Check your bottle. Check your bottle. Because, see, we get to choose that we're going to pour this bottle out 
and I'm going to go and I'm going to pray for my enemy. We get to choose that what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that my bottle is full. So when something contaminated hit my bottle, I'm going to say, God, this is submission. I don't care who did it. God knew they did it. Even the people from our past that did stuff to us, that arrested us at early ages. You don't have to stay in bondage. <laughs> you don't have to stay in bondage because see what happens is that we, 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 even people that go to prison, a lot of them have a parole date, a release date. Are you going to grant yourself parole? The judge said, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. Jesus is the judge, and he said you're not guilty. So it doesn't really matter what you have been programmed to think about yourself. The ministry of Jesus, not going hard for Christ church. This is for the people online. The ministry of Jesus said you weren't guilty. There's a transformation that's necessary for us to be the salt of the earth and to be the light of the world. And one of the revelations that I had just this morning was I, I, I always ask God, what's the word for today? What's the word for today? And he said, press. And then I start thinking about Okay, how do you press this vessel with the bones and the spirit in it? Uh-uh, I need you empty. I need you repentant. I need you to get to a place where there's no offense. There's nothing. You're totally trusting me for everything. Every decision you're asking this Holy Spirit that I've placed inside of you to give you direction, I need you right there. Because there was 10 virgins that had oil in their lamps. And we know the story, five of them had enough oil and five of them didn't. But what happens when Jesus is pressing you is that the oil continues to flow. If the oil continues to flow and there's no stop, then what you got is you got light. You got light that's going to take you through. So when you're dealing with people and situations and relationships, if Jesus is inside of you and he's pressing, then that all, y'all not getting this, are you? <laughs> the all is coming and you'll never run out. So it wasn't that the women were unprepared, they was unsubmitted. They were unsubmitted. There's a scripture in, in Matthew 17 and 2, which is my point number four, which is transfiguration. At this point, Jesus had fulfilled everything necessary. He had fulfilled everything necessary to build his street credibility up. <laughs> Jesus had walked on water. He had turned water into wine at the wedding. He had raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus made it very clear who, whose he was. He made it clear who he is. He made it clear who he'll always be, that spirit that never dies. In Matthew 17 and 2, it says, As the men watched Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like sun and his clothes became as white as light. I didn't write down the scripture, but y'all, right before that, Jesus was trying to prepare his disciples what was about to happen, right? So he's telling them that the, these, these, these teachers and, and these, these um, I'm sorry, uh, I went blank. He was telling the people that they were gonna kill him. Let me just leave it, leave it real plain. He was telling the people that, that he was about to die because they were gonna kill him. And so Peter, 
Peter came up to him and he's like, I rebuke you, Lord. You know, don't be saying that you about to die. Well, Jesus quickly let him know that you're looking out of your human eyes. See, my God, 42 generations ago, has said that this is necessary because if I don't go, I can't send the comforter. If I don't die, there's gonna need to be some more sacrificing. And every time you treat the Lord like you gotta come back and rebuild the veil so that we gotta go back through that process, you killing our Lord and Savior over again. His death on Calvary was good enough. You just gotta accept that it was good enough because it's good enough for me. How many people is that good enough for? Come on, give it, this is what we praise him, yes. If it was it good enough for you, was it good enough? See, we've got to express that in spirit and in truth and realize that the basics of this walk is really not that hard. I know y'all look up here and y'all see pastor and everybody seem like they, when they produce in a word, they got it all together. No, it's not, it's, it's not on me, it's in me. <laughs> it's not on me, it's in me. That's the product of when you're spending time with the Lord. You get to be a walking, talking word that's gonna help some people out in your life. It shouldn't take any time to convince, any more time to convince you that Jesus is the answer, he's the way, he's the truth, he's the light. It shouldn't take anything else. Shouldn't be another sequel to this message. Shouldn't take anything else for us to get to this point. The altar's open. I would recommend that everyone in this room stand at this point and make up your mind, make a decision. Even if you chose that you were gonna serve the Lord, if our minds, if our spirit got contaminated somewhere along the way, this is where we get to make up with the Father and we get to come and worship him in spirit and in truth and we get to come and pray and we get to lay down even that what is it that you love so much that is keeping you from the father because see the enemy got a plan and you don't know if tonight's the last night that you're going to have breath in you. You don't know if tonight's the last night that you'll get to pray over your child. You don't know if tonight is the last night that you'll get to even say, Abba, Father. You don't know if tonight is the last night that you'll get to say, Lord, forgive me. You don't know what's getting ready to happen to you. But God is a generational thinker. It's real easy for us to go somewhere and get something to eat and end up with some type of poisoning and all of a sudden now we're in the hospital and all of our organs are shutting down. It's real easy for us to jump in our cars and start driving down the street and you may not be drunk, a drunk driver could come and hit you at that moment and you did not take the opportunity to say, Lord, forgive me. Father God, I accept you as my personal Lord and Savior. And I don't know how to do this, God. I don't know how to do this, and that's okay. It's okay not to know. But it's not okay not to submit. It's not okay. We need you, Lord. going to ask right now that if there's anyone in the room that has not given your life to Christ, now is an opportunity for you to come. Is there anyone that has not ever given their life to Christ and would like to do so on tonight? Just raise your hands right where you are. Is there anyone in the room that would like to reded rededicate your life to Christ?
One thing the Lord is not going to do, it has to be your will. It has to be your choice. He's not going to pull you up here. It has to be totally your decision. If we could just all close our eyes right now and just take a second. All over the building, if we could just close our eyes and just take a second and have an intimate moment with the Lord. Take a second and reflect on the goodness of the Lord. Take a second and reflect on the the very mercy of the Lord his graciousness and his hand for generations the Lord has stood with his arms wide open waiting to embrace him. and many have neglected him and many have rejected him and every day he wakes up and he still has his hands out waiting to embrace there's not a day that he has not embraced so can we just take a second and receive the embrace of the Lord we know that the father knows hearts and so there's not a special phrasing of words that can be said but if your heart receives the Lord, he can enter right into that space, right into the sacredness of an intimate moment between you and him. Lord, we, tonight we choose you. Tonight we choose you. We, we don't choose we don't choose these temporary things anymore. We don't choose our, our wants and our desires anymore. Choices and decisions away from you always end badly. And so Lord, we stop making decisions without you. And we stop making decisions that don't gratify you, that don't bring you, Lord, May our decisions and our lives please you. Lord, may our lives be pleasing to you. May you look at us and be pleased. May we come out of may we come out of sin and may we come out of oppression and come into sonship and daughterhood in the Lord. Lord, we choose you. We lay aside yokes. We lay aside bondage. We lay aside sin. We lay aside weight. The weights of light. We, Lord, we take off depression. We take off sadness. We wipe our faces from weeping and toil. And we choose you, Lord. We choose you. And we know that when we choose you, we are renewed. We are renewed and we are revived and we are restored and we have another chance. Another chance at this thing called life and that we would have it more abundantly. So Lord, we choose you because every other choice really doesn't make sense. Every other choice really doesn't make sense. So in our hearts, Lord, we say yes. And we don't just receive salvation, but we receive a lordship relationship. We receive a lordship relationship. A relationship that follows us for the rest of our days. A relationship that honors you in the morning and pleases you in the evening. We bow our head, Lord, and we thank you for an easy yoke and we thank you for 
a light burden. Lord, we thank you for telling us that we could cast all of our burdens and all of our cares upon you for you cared for us. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity to be in your lordship. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to choose you. There are many people who did not make it to a moment like this, but Lord, we get a moment to choose you. There are many people that didn't make it to an altar like this, but we get to choose you. Friends and family have gone and people have, their days have ended and we get an opportunity to choose you again. So Lord, help us to wake up in the morning and choose you. Help us to wake up in the morning and choose you and choose you the next day and the next day that we would have weeks of choosing you and that we would run this race in consistency. Lord, give us consistency in our walk with you. Consistency in our in our prayer time, consistency in our study time that we would that we would seek after you affectionately, that we would seek after you intimately, that we would read and study you at our jobs, that we would study you in our cars, that we would study you in our bedrooms, that we would that we would affectionately love you. Affectionately, that we would romantically love you, that we would adore you that we would see it as a pleasure to bow before you, that we would see it as a privilege to worship you, that we would see it as an honor, Lord. For the wages of sin is death, and we don't have to pay the toll because you chose us. We thank you for your blood, Lord. We thank you for your sacrifice for laying down your life. Nobody took it. You gave it up. We thank you for laying down your life for us, choosing to die. Choosing to die so that we could live. We thank you, Lord. We th- we're, our souls are grateful. From the depths of our soul is gratefulness. Lord, if for anyone in this room had, who has not received you in salvation, for anybody in this room who has not received you as Lord, Father, I pray mercy and grace. I pray mercy and grace and I ask that you give them more days. I ask that you give them another opportunity to choose you. I ask that you give them another, another day to choose you. I ask that you give them another day and another opportunity to please you. Father, we thank you and we glorify you. We thank you and we glorify you that you be lifted high and that you be exalted. Father, we thank you for this word, this word that has nourished our souls. We thank you for this word that has nourished our very being. Lord, help us to choose you every day to make the right decision and make you Lord every day. Lord, I ask that you bless us and that you cover us cover us with a renewed grace with a renewed mercy father we repent of every sin we repent of every sin every impure thought everything that didn't glorify you our failings our failures times that we slipped away we repent lord we repent lord we are sorry and we take up your grace lord help us empower us to be strong empower us give us courage lord to walk through these days when we are tempted on every hand tempted to return on every pathway tempted to go back every hour but lord help us to choose you help us to be strong help us to be witnesses witnesses of the glory of god may we be empowered may your grace and your holy spirit rest upon us May we tread upon serpents and scorpions. May we be your very essence. May we touch the sick and they recover. May we be empowered, spirit-filled Christians, followers of Christ, disciples, strong, able-bodied, 
and motivated. Lord, we seek to glorify you. Lord, I bless every minister in this church, every leader in this church, every pastor in this church, every servant in this church, every lay member in this church, the sheep and the servants. Lord, bless them all. Bless us all, Lord. Love us, Lord. Embrace us the more, Lord. Shine on us the more, the Lord. Shine on us the more, Lord, like you shined on Moses' face, that people would see us and know that we have been with you. That people would see us and know that we have been with you. Lord, we, we live our lives to glorify you. We live our lives to glorify you. All of these things we do for your name and your name alone. And Father, we pray this in your son's most holy and his precious name. And the whole body said, amen and amen.